Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, brethren. Amen. I greet you tonight, another night, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. It's an honor for me, a privilege to be here one more night, to be able to speak to you and to break bread. Amen. You know, it's always humbling, amen, when I get the opportunity to uh, impart the word of God to you. And I pray, God, that tonight at the end of the session, amen, that we will be, we will learn something. I must confess that tonight's Bible study uh, will take a little different turn in terms of how we will look at uh, the whole thing about contending from the faith, uh, contending for the faith, amen. But our aim is to, uh, to give us enough knowledge, amen, so that we can be able to contend for the faith. Amen. And understand what we are a part of. It was recently I was in Sunday school and one of the students asked me, Sir, what, um, where did this whole doctrine of the Trinity come from? You know, um, the person wanted to understand why it is that we, we, there's, a, there's a difference between what we teach and what other people teach. You know, and you know, as I thought about it and I realized, and this was something that was on my heart even before that because I said to the student, Praise God that our aim is in Bible study for this year is to look at the foundational tenets of the faith. Amen. Not just to tell you to contend for the faith, but give you enough information and tool and meat. Amen. So that you can stand up for this truth. So our aim tonight is to look at contending from the faith, the oneness of God. Amen. And we'll be looking at it for the next two weeks. This week we'll be looking at the historical development amen, of doctrines that emerged out of Christianity and how, and how dangerous it can be, amen. And, and, and last week we, we spoke about, we look at our week before last, we look about uh, contending for sound doctrine, ensuring that we have sound doctrine, praise God. So in a similar way, tonight our aim is to move forward in relation to that and to start taking on the tenets, amen, of what our faith is amen and tonight we'll start with the whole topic of the oneness of god so for the next two weeks this week and next week we'll be looking at the oneness of god this week from a historical perspective amen uh, where did this whole doctrine of the trinity comes from i mean why we don't uh believe it praise god and and and, and what are the dangers in it amen and then next week we'll be looking at bible Amen. We'll be looking at what exactly does the Bible teach when the Bible says in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Amen. What, what, what are these scriptures talking about? You know, you know uh, when the Bible says in the beginning was the word and the word is with God. We're going to dissect and we're going to even look at troubling scriptures, you know, and God said, let us make man, you know, and we, you hear Trinitarians all the time will tell you that the word there uh, for God, especially in Genesis chapter 1, is Elohim. And they will tell you that Elohim is a plural word, which it is. But we're going to try to dissect all of these things and look at uh, what these things mean. Even the very name of God, the YHWH, which is called the Tetragrammaton. We're going to be touching some of these things next week. But this week we're looking at the historical development of, of, of what had taken place and, and how dangerous it, it is over a short period of time, amen, for a new doctrine to emerge that has, that has somehow had a grip in Christianity for many years, amen. Uh, before we start, let us just open with prayer. Let's bow your heads as I pray. Great God, we thank you, God, for another night. I pray right now, God, that you'll give me clarity of thought. I pray, now, God, you'll help me, Lord Jesus, that the words that I'm about to speak, it will come forth, God, uh, with free utterance. We come against every plan that the enemy has, every the plan that the devil has to stop this word tonight. I pray, right, God, in the name of Jesus, that you will rest upon me. God, let your hands be upon me tonight, that as I speak your word, that somebody will be blessed, that somebody will hear the word of God, and somebody will, will be led to truth. I pray right now, God, in the name of Jesus. You say, where two or three are gathered together, touching anything concerning you, you're in the midst to grant and to bless. Bless this Bible study tonight. Bless every person that is on. Amen. And I pray, God, that, that even the new convert or persons who are versed, amen, that they will learn something from this lesson tonight. Do it right now, God, for your name's sake and for your glory. In the mighty and the most exalted name of Jesus, I pray. 
in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Praise God. So tonight we are going to be going to the slides, and I must apologize tonight that we don't have, amen, the person who is signing with us, amen, uh, but you know, next week, God's willing, the person will be here. So we apologize for that, amen, but we'll push forward anyway with God. So God bless you as we try to go uh, tonight in tonight's study, in Jesus' name. So let's move to the slides. We move to the oneness of God, part one. Now, I want us to understand that, as I said before, for the past few weeks, we have looked at uh, three topics. We look at earnestly contending for the faith. And we started there because we wanted to get an understanding of where the terminology came from. Amen. When we talk about earnestly contending for the faith, amen, we wanted to know that we want to understand that this was not that something that Bishop came up with, but this was something that even from the first century, the Apostle Jude, amen, based on what was happening in the church of that time, was telling the saints that they need to earnestly contend for the faith. Amen. And we realized that in, the, in, in week one, we realized that Jude was about to write a letter to the church. Amen. And um, he went on to say, it was needful for me, amen, to write unto you of the common salvation. So his plan was to write about the common salvation. Praise God. Jude chapter 1 and verse 3. He said, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So we realize that from week one, amen, that Jude was writing and telling people that, look here, you need to earnestly contend for the faith. From week one, we learn about the teaching that existed against the faith. Amen. We realize that men uh, came in unaware and they were preaching doctrines that were contradictory, amen, to what the apostles laid and what the apostles taught. Amen. We looked at the fact that God will, God's, what God's will is and that God will judge a sinful lifestyle. So all of these men who came in and they brought their false theology, which led, amen, to, to a downward spiral even in the, live, in the lives of people brought judgment with it. And we did mention from week one the consequences of how God judges us. We say God can judge us based on, amen, uh, for example, in the case of the children of Israel, he, he took them through the wilderness for 40 years. Your judgment might be prolonged. Amen. It might be a case where God, you are being judged and you're just, you're, you're just walking in judgment. And we look at the case of Sodom and Gomorrah, where we said that God judged them swiftly. Amen. So sometimes when God is judging sin, it's over a period of time. When God is judging sin, it might be prolonged. And we look at even the case of the angels. And this was the example that Jude brought out where, where, where judgment was reserved for them. Amen. So in a similar way, we, we saw that. And we look at the issues in the church in Jude's time and how he addressed them. And we look at the recommendation, praise God, that he gave to the Christian and how to combat the issue. He said, build up yourselves on your most holy faith. He said, pray in the Holy Ghost, praise God. He said, keep yourselves in the love of God, uh, praise God. And he said, uh, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. He said, for some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. So we're able to, to, to look at the recommendation of what we need to do in relation to earnestly containing from the faith. Then we look at week two, we look at how to defend the faith. Amen. And we looked at the gospel. Amen. The whole issue of the gospel. We defined what the gospel was. We said that the gospel was the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God. And, and we, we looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And this is just a quick revision in terms of how these things come together. Amen. We look at the fact that we must contend for the gospel. We must be able to defend the faith. We said that the gospel, according to 1 Corinthians 15, is what we preach. Amen. He said, Paul said, this is the gospel that we preach unto you and the gospel that you have received, the gospel which we stand on, and it's the gospel that saves us. Amen. And we look at the fact that we defined based on the scripture what the gospel was. It was the death, it is the burial, and it is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. And we, we look at defending the gospel and what it means to defend the gospel. We look at the fact that the very apostles were willing to defend the gospel to the T. Amen. 
and, and, and how they went through many things. For example, Peter and John was arrested. Amen. We look at the fact that, that some were thrown into prison. Amen. And what Peter made a comment. He said, we must obey God rather than men. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 29. Amen. Uh, we look at why we need to defend the gospel. We said the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. We said the gospel is the only way to eternal life. Amen. And we said there are many false teaching and ideologies that compete with or contradict or try to contradict. Or better, it does. It contradicts the gospel. But in that sense, we need to defend the gospel. For it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believe. So we were able to look at that. And we just practically look at the defending why we need to defend the gospel and how do we defend the gospel what the key ingredients were in defending the gospel we need to have a clear understanding of the message of salvation we need to be familiar with the major themes and 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 doctrines and teachings of the bible doctrines mean teaching so we need to be very familiar with these we need to understand the background the beliefs and the objections of people we are sharing the gospel with and this is one of the aspects that we are going to take it from tonight we want to look at some of the background amen because a lot of the these people come to you with teachings and with stuff and they will tell you that we 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 don't teach the the orthodox christianity and the church back then used to teach this but we are going to look from a historical perspective what did the church actually teach amen and the last lesson i did was uh the importance of sound doctrine we talk about embracing sound doctrine we say sound doctrine is good for salvation it's good for your sanctification praise god we said that we, as believers, we must be equipped with sound doctrine. Amen. We must study the Bible. And we look at Joshua 1 verse 8. Amen. He said, we must listen to good teachers of the gospel. And I did mention people like David K. Bernard. And you have teachers like Bishop Daly. And men who, 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 who study the word. Amen. Are, are willing to impart the word of God to you. We so must test the spirit, amen, because not every person on the TV that we watch, not because it sounds good, means that it's of God. And some of these things and these quotes that are being said today, they really sound um, good and nice. But when you really check them out and you, 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 you put it against scripture, you realize that it has some, some, some little flaws in there. For example, learning to love yourself is the greatest love of all amen and that's a that, that that's a that that's a song that's in a song and it has become a quote by many amen learning to love yourself but the bible does not teach that the bible says greater love hath no man than this that a man should lay down his life for his friend amen and therefore to make a comment that the loving yourself is the greatest love of all is a great contradiction as a matter of fact the bible itself tell you in timothy that the spirit speak expressly that in the latter days some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils the bible says in the last days perilous times shall come for men shall be lovers of their own selves amen so we see these things are slowly being injected into the body and if you're not careful even in the body of Christ but guess what we are here amen as teachers of the word as preachers of the gospel and we are encouraging you that you should ensure that you have sound doctrine praise God praise God now tonight we're going to look at how the apostle Paul uh war in the church and we're going to look at the scripture from deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4 because we're talking about um the oneness of god no the scripture in deuteronomy and these are our key verses tonight deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4 says hear o israel the lord our god is one lord this this verse is a very short verse but this verse is the central verse of all of Judaism. And I notice I, I underline the word one. That's the Hebrew word ekad. Amen. Now we're going to talk about what these things actually mean. The word uh, here is shima. Amen. And, and it's very important when God says you need to listen to something. It, it, it means it's very important. It's like a teacher said, listen. Amen. You're in a class and you say you need to listen to what I'm saying. Amen. God wanted to emphasize the fact that this was very important to him. Hear, O Israel. Shema means to hear. O Israel. The Lord. Capital L-O-R-D. Which is again, that's the Tetragrammaton. Y-H-W-H. -H, which speaks to the name of God. 
And we're going to talk about that. What we're going to uh, to a bit to, to tell that each of these letters uh, can be subscribed to something. And we're going to look at that the fact that what this the very in this very verse points back to somebody that was in the future. But anyway, we're going there. We're, we're jumping. We don't want to jump. Cause next week we're going to do some real stuff, and we're going to really pull out the oneness of God. And even in this one verse, there's so much that can be pulled from this one verse that will blow your mind. Amen. But it says here, O Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord. And note again, the word Lord there in both cases is uppercase L-O-R-D. Amen. Normally in scripture, when you see this word L-O-R-D in uppercase, it, is, it, it, it means the name of God should be placed there. Uh, so in the Hebrew translation, what they do, because they don't want to say the name of God, they say Adonai. But it's actually um, W H Y H W H which they say is hard and has lost its pronunciation over the years, but it actually has a deep meaning. Amen. You see L-O-R-D, that's the name of God. And you see the word capital L-O-R-D, only in reference to God. And you see common L-O-R-D, which is Adon, or a local ruler, and that is in reference to man. So Sarah call her husband, Lord and Master, because that word Lord is common, L-O-R-D, is Adon, he's a local ruler. Amen. But God is capital L-O-R-D, he's Adonai, a capital L-O-R-D, which is the, 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 the name of God. We're going to talk about that as we go there. But here it is that Paul was writing to the church in Colossians. And this was way before the ending of the first century. Amen. And he was writing to the church at Coloss in Colossians. And he says, look here. Uh, and, and he said, beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. The interesting thing about the book of Colossians is that one of the key themes in the book of Colossians is the supremacy of Christ. Amen. The, 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 the Bible or the, that particular book, when Paul wrote that book to the, to the church at Colossae, amen, it begins with the, the, the affirmation of the preeminence of Christ. And we're going to talk about that because these are some of the good things we're going to pull out next week. But I tell you, we have a lot to do, you know. But our aim at the end of the study is to ensure that every one believer is not shaken. What you have, brethren, is truth. And Paul is emphasizing, amen, even in the book of Colossians, that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Praise God. In other words, you know man can see God. God is, a, God is omnipresent. God is a spirit. But the, in order for you to, the only way you can see him is through the face of Jesus Christ. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father, the Bible says, he had declared him. That is in the book of St. John chapter 1. So Paul was emphasizing that Jesus is the image of of the invisible God. Praise God. He said that he's the firstborn over all cre creation. And, and, and we're going, we're going, we're going, we're, it's interesting we'll talk about firstborn, but we're going to look at that. Amen. And he's the head of the church. The interesting thing about this is that Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9, which follows this verse where Paul is saying, let no man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, which is practically where uh, we see this emerging of false teaching coming from, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him, so here the scriptures follow, for in him, which is Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Praise God. So uh, the, the objective of our Bible study tonight is threefold. Well, two uh, part two can be broken up into two parts. So we're looking at the concept of what is called strict monotheism. Amen. Now we're going to look at it from the, from the perspective of Judaism first. And then we're going to move that into Christianity. And we're going to show how it has evolved over the years. How, how, how the philosophy and the, 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 the traditions and the teaching and, 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 the, and the, the fact that men were using their own intellect to try to understand God have shifted the mark. 
You know, there was a teacher who, from Faith Chapel years ago, who would always talk about the, the principle of drifting, and he would make reference to the point that you might start at a point, but the moment you start to drift, I mean, uh, initially, the drifting seems uh, not so bad, but over time, if you continue to drift, and you don't pay attention to the drifting, I mean, you will be shocked how far out you will reach. I mean, it's like being on a boat and you're not focused and you're just in the boat and the boat is moving and you're not even paying attention until when you look up, you're so far from shore. Amen. And you're wondering, how did I get here? In a similar way, what we're going to realize is that the doctrine of the Trinity, amen, did not just start overnight. Amen. I not the concept of one man. But what had happened over a period of about 400 years, amen, from the start of the church from AD 33 to about AD 381, we had what is called the Council of Constantinople, and that's where we're going to stop. You're going to realize that there has been some serious development, amen, in the doctrine, praise God, of the Trinity, amen. And we're going to see that as the Bible says, we have to be very careful. And the funny thing about it, as I'm talking here, and even though I'm talking about the oneness of God, let me quickly add that the same concept that applies here applies to every other doctrine in church the moment you start to drift from it you will be surprised how far you will reach from what the truth was so you started with a amen and because of you start adding to a and you start analyzing a and you start thinking that nothing is so wrong with a amen and you start adding other little things to it over time you'll be surprised how far you would reach so we look at the concept of strict monotheism in judaism and christianity they're going to try to explain the gradual development of what is called a trinitarian doctrine that occurred over several centuries and involved many theologians and thinkers many people many apologists uh, men like uh men like tertullian and Origen and and and, and men like Ari, Ari, the Arius and all of these men who have come on the scene over the, over those years they have added to it and they've added their peace to it amen sibalius and um Cibalius, sorry and all of these men who have added sections and and contributed in some way or some form amen um you're going to realize that when this thing started there was not even a trinity they, were, they didn't even sure what they want to do with the Holy Spirit. The, the, the debate was really about Jesus. That's where it started. Amen. And they, they never know what to do with the Holy Spirit. Amen. And, and, and it eventually, it, they, they, they came and emerging until they came up with the Nicene Creed. Amen. Which was, which was practically um, going against the Arian Creed in the same time. And then by 381, you had the full development of the, Ni or the, 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 the Nicene Creed. So it started in 320, 325 AD, somewhere there. But it was fully developed by 381. And we're going to talk about that. I want to explain the concept of oneness. We're going to explain the concept of modalism. Because you will hear people say, oh, you Pentecostal are just modalist. Yeah, and I don't know if you have ever heard it. Um, you, 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 that's what you believe. But we do, we're not modalist brethren. And I'm going to explain to you what that is. It sounds very similar to what we have. And there are tenets to it. And the truth be told, there is a great possibility that the, 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 the teaching of modalism, amen, could have been corrupted um, by other thinkers. You know, people will, like for example, somebody will hear what oneness teach and they will leave with their own concept of what they think we believe. Amen. So there's a great possibility that the, 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 the teachers who taught modalism, modalism their, their teaching was corrupt. Well, that's just speculation. But whatever, uh, whatever emerged from that, um, um, that they call modalism is not what we believe. So whatever they left that scene with in the second century, amen, going into the third century, and what their concept of modalism is, and what they say that is what they want these Pentecostals teach today, amen, is not what we teach. And I'm going to explain that. We're going to look at the whole thing about subordinationism, and finally we're going to look at how that moved from that concept into the whole thing of Trinitarianism, which was really... Uh, something that was debating against subordinationism i'm going to talk about that right 
and we're going to look at it in relation to the Godhead and we're going to look at their differences. So, what's the difference between the oneness of God versus modalism versus subordinationism and finally Trinitarianism, what we will call classical Trinitarianism. And the funny thing about Trinitarianism, it is so confusing because it has, again, what the traditional um, Trinitarianism that came out of 325, 381, AD is not the same that has been taught today. As a matter of fact, when you listen to a lot of Trinitarians today, sometimes you get the impression that they are oneness. But that's where the confusion comes in. False doctrine has a way of, of not being clear. Amen. And it has a way of keep on shifting. Amen. But the only set of people who hold on to the real Nicene Creed today, in my opinion, are Catholics. Amen. Most of these people that came out of the Azusa Street, they got some revelation, but they held on to that false teaching from back in the day. But we can talk about these things, all right? So, let us go back to the inception of this thing. We're going to realize that the whole teaching about the oneness of God started in uh, Judaism. If you can remember, God had called Abraham from the land of the Chaldeans. Amen. Abraham was living in a society where people were mainly polytheistic. As a matter of fact, I, I was teaching my Sunday school on Sunday and I was telling them that one of the main gods that existed that time was the sun god. Amen. And, and they, they believed they worshipped the sun. Amen. Um, you had God like back in the day, like Tammuz and Semiramis, um, and 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 you, you you had gods like Baal and all of these people. So during the time of Abraham, people worshipped multiple gods. Amen. Even to the point that even in the New Testament, the, the Christian Church, they were called atheists. Um, the Romans called them atheists, and the reason why they called them atheists was not based on the fact that they did not worship a god. But was based on the fact that they only worshipped one God. And they could not understand the concept. Because in all their things, they have a God for everything. Amen. So here it is that the whole concept of, 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 of the oneness, as far as scripture is concerned, amen, started with this father of faith who God called from the land of the Chaldeans and said, look here, come out from among the people and I'm going, and, and I'm going to reveal some things to you. So the religion of Judaism began with a revelation firstly of the one God because now Abraham was not being called to say, okay, there were multiple gods that exist. For the first time, he lived in a, in a society that worshipped many gods. But God said, I'm taking you from that society and I'm bringing you to that you can understand that I am the one God. As a matter of fact, I am self-sufficient. When Abraham, when, when Moses met him, I said, what is my name? He said, tell them that I am that I am. Again, that is the tetragrammaton, which means that he is self-sufficient. There is, there, there, there is none like him. There, he, is, he is everything. Amen. And, and we realize that the God in Judaism from the very inception from God called Abraham was always a concept that he is strictly monotheistic. And these are terms that I am using and I'm going to define. Amen. So from the very inception that God called him, the concept that was in his mind was no longer a concept that there were many gods. There was no longer a God for the sun. There was no longer a God for the moon. Amen. There was no longer a God to be worshipped for the river. There was no longer a Nile God. You know, and I love, I think God had a sense of humor because when God even attacked Egypt, what God did, all of the plagues was an attack on all the gods for, for them to understand and for Egypt to understand that look here, I am the only God. Amen. So he attacked all their gods in all of the plagues. Amen. Everything that they were worshipped. They worship the Nile as a god, God make it blood. Amen. They worship the flies, God used it as a plague. Amen. They worship the fear of God, kill the firstborn. Whatever God has shown that he is God. Amen. And, and the concept of strict monotheism is what God had uh, embedded in Judaism from the very inception of that religion. So important was the, the, this concept of oneness that out of all the laws that exist in the Torah, and there are many laws that exist in the Torah, out of the Ten Commandments, and I remember doing a teaching uh, on the Sabbath um, sometime, and I went into the fact that there were six hundred and something laws, and you know, uh, you talk about the, the the ten commandments and the explanation of these in these six hundred and thirteen. But can I tell you the central thing, the central tenet of the teaching of Judaism is found in what is called the Shema. 
the Shema we just mentioned that a while ago, and it's considered the central part. The word Shema, let me remind you, has means, it actually means to hear. Amen. It means to hear. So in Judaism, they had two things that were very important. That we found that in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. Amen. Uh, we, we, we see... We see in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4 that you're supposed to put these, these commandments upon your right and when you're going out or when you're coming in, you talk about uh, must be upon your doorposts. What was so important? You must teach it diligently unto your children. I shall talk about it when you're sitting in your house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up, thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hands and they shall be as what frontless between thine eyes. Amen. So what happened is that Jews every morning, every single morning and every single night, amen, it is said that the Jews would have said, look here, hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Or better yet, as we have it in the King James Version, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. So they had two things. They had what is called the Tephilim, amen, and the, the Mezuzah. The Tephilim is what you see him have wrapped around his hand there and, and he's, as he's looking in the, in, in the, the scripture. I you know what was written on that. That's a symbol as saying that Hear, O Israel, the Lord. And he has that little box on his head. What was written inside of that, the Tephilim, what was written inside of that is the, fat, is the Shema. It had to be bound in between his eyes. In other words, God don't want you to forget it. Up here, so it must die. Your mind, God wants it embedded in your heart. God wants you to understand that I am one. It was also placed upon their doorposts. It's that thing there in the red. It's called a mezuzah. Amen. And therefore, it's very important that we understand that from the very first century, there was strict monotheism in the Judaism religion. Praise God. So, the Shema looks like this. The transliteration of the Hebrew, the transliteration of the Hebrew says Shema Israel Adonai Elino Adonai Echad. Amen. So we see Shema or Shema Israel Adonai Elohino Adonai Echad. And what that particularly is saying is that here, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. So from Judaism, from the days of Judaism, from the, all of the Old Testament, the emphasis for the Jew was on the fact that there was one God. And I want you to get that. And when I say one, we're not talking about one in unison. Amen. Because that's what Trinitarianism teach. We're talking about a numerical one. He is one. That's what they believe. Ask any Jew. Amen. They will tell you that they believe that there is one numerical oneness of God. So this is why in the Old Testament, every Jew must recite it daily as a part of their prayer. Well, we spoke about that already. Talk about the fact that they literally obey this command today by binding tefillins. We said a while ago on their left forearm and forehead when they pray. Why God did that? God wanted to remember all the time that I am one. And they placed the mezuzah on their doors, on their gates. What did they say? Every time when they pray, Shema, Israel, Adonai, Elino, Adonai, Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Brethren, the basis of oneness theology is a radical concept of monotheism. So when we talk about oneness theology, which is what we believe, oneness theology, the teaching of God, the fact that we believe that God is one, is a radical concept of what we believe as apostolics. Amen. Let's just define, I've been using the word monotheism, and I, am a, I, I don't want to assume that everybody on the Bible study understands what that means. So the word monotheism is a combination of two Greek words. Um, they talk about the etymology of words, words, words that come together to, to make what the word is. When we talk about, for example, theology, you talk about theos, that's the Greek word, uh, amen, and logos, amen. Those are the two words that would make up theology. Um, 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 theos means God, logos means the study of. 
um, or it could mean a thought. It actually means the study of in this concept. So we talk about theology, you're talking about the study of God. Amen. In a similar way, the word monotheism is a combination of two words. It comes from the Greek word mono, which actually means one, theos, which means God. So when we say monotheism, we're talking about the belief in one God. Now, one of the reasons why we, they, they've added the whole term strict monotheism is because people have a, have a concept. They're saying, for example, Trinitarians will say that they believe in one God. And, and I guess they do that because they are trying to still hold on to the concept of the first century and merge it with a concept that came out of, that, 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 that was paganistic. So they didn't want to be called tritheistic which means that they believe in three gods. Even though that was one of the teachings that emerged during that time and that was quickly uh, shut down as hearsay, amen, because to hold on to theism or Bilitarianism, which believe in two gods, what you're doing, you're diverting very far from what the first century church actually believed, which was really the concept of one God. So the issue was, how do I hold on to the oneness of the first century church but still maintain that the fact that the fathers and the holy ghost are distinct persons amen and they do that by saying by changing even the concept of the godhead and we're going to talk about that later on amen they still want to say that there is one god but there are three distinct persons in the godhead amen and and and, and the bible does not teach that and i guess i guess it is it, it really comes to a revelation of who jesus really is because if people got that and understand who Jesus was, he is God incarnate, my God. The express image of the living God. Amen. We're going to talk about that. So, tonight we're going to look at a historical timeline tonight of some things and how it has evolved over the time. So what we have is from the first century, and you will hear preachers every now and then will talk about the first century church. The church started about approximately AD 33, somewhere there, on the day of Pentecost. So the first century church would have started with about AD 33 to about AD 100. That would have been the first century. And during the first century, we have... Uh, in Acts chapter 15, uh, uh, the only major council that took place um, was the council in Acts chapter 15 where there was an issue with the Judaizers and the apostles met to iron out the issue and they sent letters to all the churches telling them what they should do. Amen. But during that time you have the birth of the church and the main teachers that existed during that time were the apostles. Amen. And, the, and, and you had like the apostle Paul who also, when he went up to Jerusalem, he realized that the doctrine that he got of Jesus was in line with everything that the apostles teach. As a matter of fact, the man had a, had a, had a handle of the word that was, that was superior. God, God handpicked the man to the point where Peter said, Look here, this man teaches truth. So many things he teaches hard to understand. But guess what? This man is a man called of God. Amen. The apostle Paul. So between AD 33 to AD 100, we find that the, the first century church evolved. And we'll look at what was being taught in the first century. Then we're going to look at the second century. Because after the apostle John died, which was the last apostle, amen, we realized that you did have men on the scene. And we're going to look at even those early second century men. Men like Polycarp and men like Ignatius and men like Hermes. And these men that existed in the early first century. Amen. What they usually teach, and then what the transition was. They start to talk about people like Justin, amen, who was an apologist in the early uh, second century. And we're going to look at what he actually taught. So Flavius Justinus, who is also called Justin, amen. And we're going to look at what his concept of God was and what his problem was, amen. Then by the time we get into the second century, or the third century, which is AD 200 to 300, you had people like Tertullian, Amen. And people like Origin. And these men are men who have developed, as it were, the doctrine of the Trinity. And as I said before, when they developed it, and they're, 
they, and they came with their teaching, the doctrine that they have of the Trinity is totally different than the doctrine of the Trinity that evolved in the 4th century. But however, most of these men contributed in some way or form, amen, to what became known as classical Trinitarianism. Amen. And then by the 4th century, you had a guy named Arius of Alexandria. Amen. And they will tell you about it. You will hear people talk about the area and controversy. Amen. Because what was happening is that there was an issue uh, where Arius was involved. And, and, and he, his teaching was rejected amen, by, by certain other teachers. Amen. And then you had what is called the Council of Nicaea. Amen. Where the where the, the debate was really about the Arian controversy. Amen. And and all and the Arian controversy came out of that. Um, there is something that I did not mention on this chart that I, I, I must put in. There was I there's the modalist view which came about really strictly in the uh, call it the third century. It started from the second, so it bridged the second to the third century. And that was something that Tertullian himself uh, debated and tried to even mock in some of his writings. Amen. Because he never understood who God was. And even though the modalism was not 100% truth, it is closer to truth than what Tertullian had. And then you had the, the, the Nicene Council and they have the Council of Constantinople. So, Let's take a ride tonight. We're going to move from AD 33 to AD uh, 381. I think you can do a 400 year journey tonight. Amen. Let's just try to do and, and the truth be told, we, we won't be. Um, I, I try to make it as clear as I possibly can um, without getting in all too much of the details, but enough information for us to. to um, to, to, to get a grasp of what was taking place. Some of these things are new to some of us. Amen. We hear, we hear some of these things and, and we, we have never seen it. For some of us, some of us who are readers know this thing like the back of our hand. But let us try to, to see how best as a church, amen, we can have an understanding of some of these things. So when people approach us, we understand the history. And you understand again, as I said before, that you are in truth. Amen. So in AD 33 to AD 100, we're going to call this period the apostolic age. This was the time, as I said before, where the, the apostles, um, the apostles practically were the teachers, and the, the apostles were the persons who were, were, were dictating and, and writing scripture and writing letters and preaching and teaching. Amen. Um, so we had from the day of Pentecost where the church was emerged, we had um, the Apostle Peter preaching that first gospel message and we spoke about that a couple of weeks ago when we looked at the whole issue of the gospel. But during the start of the church, you can realize that there was something that was happening. All the apostles that were there preached that there was one God. Amen. The scriptures... Um, in many places, any manuscript that you go into, amen, you will realize that all of these, the concept that was found in all of these teaching was practically um, along the line of the oneness. As a matter of fact, there's a verse that said there are three that bear record in heaven. Um, the word, the word, the spirit and the blood, if my mind serves my mind, right? And it is believed, well, it is noted that when you look at all the manuscripts, that verse is not in it. When you look at later manuscripts, it's inserted. And what they get to realize is that it was a monk who came from the way in the third century who actually inserted as a part of inscription. And it became a part of scripture. When you look at older manuscripts, you realize it's not in there. So it is called the acritical text. The reason why we accept it because he, he concluded his statement with saying by these three are one. Amen. But it was really a critical text. And, but all of scripture... When it speaks about Jesus, it speaks about him. All the scriptures that are written, all the manuscripts that were written, that they have copies of from the first century, amen, you realize that they all declare that Jesus was God. They preach that Jesus is the revelation of the Old Testament God incarnate. And that could have been the only teaching that they teach. As a matter of fact, if you can remember, the church itself came out of in a sense, Judaism. On the day of Pentecost, it was strictly Jews that were there. Amen. And, 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 and their, their concept of God did not change because they changed from Judaism to Christianity. Their concept was that 
There is going to be a Messiah to come. And this Messiah is God manifest in the flesh. That's just why when Thomas met him, and I don't want to jump into some stuff I'm going to go next week, but when Thomas met him, and, and he said, look here, me, 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 I can't believe unless I put my hand in your hand and feel the nail print and so on and so forth. And when Jesus was able to do that, he said, my Lord and my God. What Thomas was saying was coming from a, from a, from a Jewish perspective. He understood that, look here, that, that, that this man was God. As a matter of fact, in St. John chapter 8, the Bible said the Jews took up stone to stone him. And why they say, because he being a man called himself God. Note, and remember a while ago I said, their concept of God was based on strict monotheism. So they, the only thing the church knew in the first century was that Jesus was God. That was their belief. There was no two ways about it. They, they, as a matter of fact, when you go into the scriptures in the New Testament, you will see over and over and over again in different places, in hymns, uh, in the book of Colossians, when they, they, some of these scriptures that we read, there were, some of them were hymns that were sung in the church, you know. Amen. The hymns were declaring that Jesus were God. Scriptures, the apostles as they wrote, they made sure to emphasize that Jesus was worshipped. And if Jesus was, was not a God, amen, if Jesus was not God, he would not have taken worship. Remember when John was about to worship the angel? And he said, don't worship me, man. Can bow down and say, no, don't worship me. Yes, and, and even though the angel was superior in power and in might to John. Amen. You can remember one angel can kill a whole nation. He said, don't worship him. Just worship God. Amen. And Jesus took worship. Amen. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, okay, if, them, if these people stop worshiping me, the stones are going to worship me. Amen. To show that he was God. So there are many verses that from the very first century that teaches us that Jesus was God. And that's what the church believed. So, for example, Matthew 2, verse 11. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child and Mary's mother and fell down and worshipped him. These were Jews. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gold and frankincense and myrrh. John 9, 38. And he said, Lord, I believed. And he worshipped him. Again, we're talking about Jesus. Hebrew 1 verse 6. And again, when he bring it in the first begotten into the world, he said, And let all the angels of God worship him. Now, let me tell you something about God. God has really established in the book of Isaiah that worship belongs to him alone. So, the idea that the New Testament church had was that Jesus must have been God. And the, the writer of the book of Hebrews saying, God was saying, here's the first begotten into the world. Let all the angels, all the angels, Michael, Gabriel, all the angels that were above and beneath, uh, good angels and fallen angels, let all the angels of God worship him. Everybody had to worship Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven. That was one of my favorite verse. And things in the earth and things under the earth. Philippians 2, 10 to 11. That at the name of Jesus, we just quote our God, every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Revelation 5, 12 to 14 says, Say with a loud voice, worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing and every creature which is in the heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in therein heard I say blessings and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Amen. Forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that lived forever and ever. This is talking about the Lamb of God. Who is the Lamb of God? John 1, 29. Behold the Lamb of God, Jesus, which taketh away the sins of the world. So what we find is that in the first century, the concept came out of Judaism. The concept of Judaism was that God is one, according to the Shema. And therefore, the church continued this. 
but their continuation of this was with additional knowledge that the God of the Old Testament which was concealed is Jesus in the New Testament which is revealed. Amen. He is the God of the Old Testament. Amen. He has come to save us. Amen. Amen. As the scripture said, Isaiah, he are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servants whom I have chosen, that he may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me was there no God formed, neither shall there be any after me. I, even I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Matthew 1, 21, she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. The, the New Testament church understood. They got the revelation that this man Jesus that walked on the waters, that this man Jesus, amen, that fed the multitude, that this man Jesus, as we said last week, that spoke to the storm. And the Bible said, what manner of man is this, that even the winds and the waves obey him? This man Jesus that spat on the ground, amen, and took mud and wiped it on the man's eye and he was able to see again. This man Jesus that turned water into wine, the New Testament church got the revelation that this was not one of the prophets, amen. This was not Elias or Jeremiah, amen. This was not Malachi or Hosea, amen. This was not Abraham or Moses. This was God of the Old Testament. The God who spoke and said, let there be. And there was. The word manifest in flesh. Praise God. But there arose a concept, a conflict after the apostle John died. So the conflict that existed in the church was this. After the death of the apostle John in the first century, the history now arose that how do we maintain Strict monotheism, because it, I must say before, in order for you to worship Jesus, you have to have an understanding of what was taking place here. Amen. And, and, and therefore, they, you had people who came on the scene who, were, who wanted to be a part of the church, but was not willing to spend enough time to maintain what the apostles teach. And, and you have to understand that the devil knows that one of the power that lies within the church it's us understanding who Jesus is. Uh, Hebrew 11, 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must first believe that I am he. But it must probably believe that he is. And that is a reward of them that diligently seek him. So, the, 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 one of the first concepts... Of, of, of knowing who God is or forgetting power with God is a revelation of who he is. And therefore the devil has injected, even from the end of the first century, a controversy. How do we maintain worshipping this one true God that we knew, that the Jews believed? How do we maintain strict monotheism that came out of Judaism and found its way into Christianity? But at the same time, still worship Jesus. Is it a case then where Jesus is God? Or is it a case where we need to have an understanding of how do we merge Jesus with God? Amen. Is it a case where how do we put all this together? And from that time, many different views arose from that time. And, and, and what we're going to do is examine some of the major ones. Next, we're going to look at what the scriptures, I would say, we really teach in relation to the doctrine of God. But we're going to examine what are the major uh, uh, doctrines that came out from this point. Amen. The controversy exists. We understand that the first century church believed something. Amen. And even early second century people, people that they call the, the, the apostolic fathers, and, and, and I don't buy that. I mean, when you hear people talk about the apostolic fathers, they're talking about second century people like... Polycarp and Ignatius, but if I will call anybody apostolic father, it would have been John and Peter and, 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 and the apostles of the first century. Eh? But you have some people who hold to that thought. So anyway, the people that came directly after the apostle John died, I mean, people like Polycarp and, 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 and these men that existed, I mean, you can realize that even in the early part of the um, second century, the concept of the oneness was maintained. It was not until about AD 50 where they even came up with a concept of plurality of divine persons. Amen. That was never mentioned before. 
Amen. And in all the writings of these men, we realize that that was not the case. So if we look at first of the early second century theologians, the early ones, you can realize that there was something about them. So for example, after the death of the apostles, uh, the apostle John or the apostles, amen, the first, the church fathers, and I, and, I, and I put fathers in quotes, in the second century, and they are closely, uh, if, if not to the T, to the biblical language that we find in scripture. And, and, and the truth be told, you can find um, the biblical language even from letters that were not necessarily part of scripture in writings that exist. And what happens is that these early set of men maintain that type of belief. So they affirm certain things. They affirm the characteristics of the oneness of God. They maintain strict monotheism. They, they maintain the absolute deity of Christ and the true humanity of Christ. So one of the things that they understood and we as apostolic need to understand is that Jesus was fully God. But Jesus was also fully man. And trying to remove any of the, the above, amen, will cause a problem. We have had an issue in recent time. Even a famous apostolic teacher, he came up with a concept called the, the doctrine of the divine flesh. Um, and, and, and if you believe that Christ's flesh was divine, amen, we have a problem. Christ's flesh was not divine. It was human. He was human. Divine flesh means that he could not die because divinity cannot die. And making Christ flesh divine is a problem. So what, what we find is that the, the second century theologian maintained the fact that Jesus was absolutely God. He was absolute deity. Amen. And he was absolute humanity. And when you get this grasp of this, it makes the oneness theology, amen, easy to understand. That is why people can't understand why did Jesus pray? Because they missed the point that he had to become a man so that he could die. But he had to be God. <laughs> All right. Okay, we're going to go to that next week. They did not describe any concept of the Trinity in their writings. All of these second century theologians made no reference to Trinitarianism at all. Amen. They never at no point in their writing talk about God in three persons. Never. And I'm sorry I forgot to, to actually bring out some of the quotes of these men. But I guess next week I'll probably show you some of the quotes of some of these men. But I can mention their names. So you have people like Clement of Rome. He, he was a bishop in about AD 90. And they find letters where he wrote to the church in Corinth. And his letters, he made reference to Jesus being God. God. He had Polycarp, who was the bishop of Smyrna. Amen. And we have a brief letter to the Philippians that was written about AD 100. And I said before, I forgot to attach some of these things. But what he did in his letter, we see where he made reference again to the fact that Jesus was God. No reference, no teachings of, the, of, of Trinitarianism was ever mentioned in these men's writing. You had people like Ignatius. And the truth be told, Ignatius is one of them where you have most of his writings. If out of all of these men, the, the one that you'd find the most writing for is probably Ignatius. Ignatius has a lot of writing. But a letter was written about AD 110. And there are seven, I say several genuine letters from him. And why I say genuine letters? Because there is a letter that was written in AD 400 that they, that they tried to ascribe to Ignatius. But they later realized that it could not be because one, it contradicted all his other writing. And it was obvious that a trinity was trying to, 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 to uh, push in his trinity and theology and ascribe it to Ignatius. Amen. But Ignatius' letters and all of them that have been found spoke about Jesus being God. And if I, I know you don't, we don't mention some of these people in church, but I want you to make note of these things. Because people will come to you and say, boy, these things. Let them understand that even the writers who wrote after the apostles, early after the apostles, but from about AD 100 to about AD 150, amen, all of these men were writing that Jesus was God. And the only letter they found of Ignatius was where, where, where it said that Jesus said he was not God. Or he said that we know that Jesus is not God. Somebody said, no, but this, this, this is not Ignatius' letter. Because in all his other letters, he said that Jesus was God. 
and then they later found out that this letter was practically not really written by him. It was, it was signed like it was him, but it was not him. And what the spiritual was trying to do was to inject Trinitarianism. That's how subtle the devil is, you know. Inject Trinitarianism and say, I ascribe it to somebody who did not even believe Trinitarianism. It doesn't even really exist, amen, during this man's time. You have Hermes, and, and he's the least known about. We really don't know more about him, but they have his writing, amen, and he wrote about AD 40 to AD 145, and in a thing called the shepherd. And guess what? In his writing also, we find him talking about Jesus being God. We have Papias who wrote about AD 125, and only fragments of his work was reserved. But it's all of these five names that were written, amen, these five names that were written, all spoke about Jesus being God. My God. And the truth be told, the truth be told, time would have failed me to tell you about other writings. We have what is called New Testament apocryphas. And what we call them apocryphas mean that they were they're not inspired books. But obviously they were they were influenced by the theology of the time. So we would not even try to make reference to them. So you had that the, the, the epistle of Barnabas and the preaching of Peter and the teaching of the twelve apostles and the second epistle of Clement. All of these things were were some of these books were we call New Testament apocryphas. But what we write, what, what, what we pull from this is that because they were written so close to the time of the apostles, the teachings that are inside of these writings. Amen. They are called pseudo, they are pseudonyms. They were so close to the right of the apostles that there was no mention at all of any form of Trinitarianism. Why do I say that, brethren? Because I want you to understand that again, let me say to you, what you are a part of is truth. You don't need to shake. Because guess what? What do you preach? What the apostles preach? You believe what the apostles believe. And guess what you believe? That Jesus is God. When you say Jesus, heaven and earth trembles because we are talking about the God of the universe. We are talking about the God who spoke light. The God whose spirit moved upon the water when it was chaotic. Amen. The God that appeared to Abraham. Amen. The God of the Old Testament. The God who parted the Red Sea. And that same God manifests himself in flesh. It is said that it, is said that it, 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 was, it was so much God. That he, he, while he was breastfeeding Mary, he was producing the milk that Mary was actually using to feed him. He was the God who did that. Amen. It, 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 it blow your mind, but guess what? That is God. So by the time these men came on the scene, you had other people coming on. So in about AD 100 to 200, about AD 150, there was the, 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 called the age of the Greek apologist. So about AD 130 to 180, we find that there was a there was no people start looking at scripture. And one of the first uh, thing that they wanted to address was the doctrine of the word. And they're saying that, okay, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. And the the, 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 the issue was about the the um the word and the son. So they're saying. The Logos, which is the word, is synonymous. The word Logos can be used interchangeably with the word Son. That's not true. We can talk about that. Amen. In the beginning was the word. Not in the beginning was the Son. We can talk about that. Anyway, but the problem now is that you had an introduction of also what was called subordinationism. Because while in the beginning was the word, they're saying that this word now has become a second divine person. And this word is also the sun. So no, 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 it, it started to have an issue. The problem, however, that came out of this is that, as I said before, they did not know what really to do with the Holy Ghost. Because while they went through scripture and they were seeing the Logos and they're seeing what the Father did from the Old Testament, not most is mentioned about the Holy Spirit. So they're not, they're not sure in terms of where to place him. So in this concept, the real debate was over the Logos as a second divine person, subordinate to the Father. Amen. One of the most significant persons that, that, that came up with this teaching was, was a guy named Flavius Justinus. 
and in most books or writings, he might say the name Justin. Amen. And he was born in a Roman colony in Samaria. And Joseph's Justin existing writings are more uh, in number than all the others, period, combined. And he influenced later writings heavily. So he wrote, and his writing was 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 clear as before around the doctrine of the logos. That is where his focus was. Now, here starts the issue. Note, there was no introduction of Trinity. There was no Trinitarian teaching yet. What the debate was, who really was the Logos? When the Bible says in St. John 1.1, 1, 1, and you have to understand, that is one of the reasons why John wrote it to, you know, when John wrote, in the beginning was the Word, he was debating the philosophers of those times who had a concept that uh, the thought of man was a bit separate from him. But John wanted them to understand that, look here, in the beginning, there was a thought, but you truly can't separate the thought from the man. So the thought was with God. In other words, God had this thought, but the thought was God. How we know it was God? Because whatever is in your mind can also come to uh, in other words, before you build a house, you have to think about the, how you're going to build this house. So you're, you're, you're in your mind, you frame, you work out the framework of how you're going to build this particular house. And then when you bring that, that framework into fruition, it becomes enlightened in terms of what was in your mind. So in the beginning, God had a thought. The thought was with God, but guess what? The thought was very God. And the thought that God had became flesh and dwelt among us. Amen. I come to St. John 1 14. But there was a big debate about who really is the Logos. And therefore, is the Logos the Son? Can we use the term Logos and Son interchangeably? Or can we use the term Word and Son interchangeably? Is the Logos the Word? Or is the Word the Son? And that was the big debate. And one of the main persons that had this problem was Flavius Justinus, or Justin as he is previously called. Now, what had happened? So then here comes the root of this thing. Now you have now an introduction of the term Trinity. Because when Justin came up with his teaching, one of the problems that they had is that it, 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 it kind of linked to more binitarianism in the sense that as i said before there was no uh mention of the holy spirit binitarianism is a teaching that there are two separate gods so two gods so like mormonism is binitarianist in the sense that they believe that if you look at if i don't know if you've ever seen any of their magazines or anything and you see like the two two men and one of them is god the father and one of them is god the son and you know there's no third one no holy spirit because they are they 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 they, they kind of spring from this type of theology right so the whole concept of the greek apologists led or one of the most forefathers of that was justin uh was bilitarianism that was what came out of that and guess what happened this this, 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 this eventually worked its way till it accumulated in Orthodox Trinitarianism in the 4th century. But guess what? During the, uh, the period of the, during this period, which is the 2nd century, what we find is that, or during the 3rd century, we find that two guys came on the scene. One by the name of Tertullian and one by the name of Origen. Amen. And what we find is that these two guys looked at the teaching that came out of Justin. And they, they said, okay, we see you mention the Father, we see you mention the Spirit. You say that one is, they're not one and the same, and one is subordinate to the other. And they said, but what about the Holy Spirit? Some said, you know what? The Holy Spirit is also there. He's not just a force, but he's there. He's a third person. So, this guy by the name of Tertullian developed the concept of the Trinity. As a matter of fact, the word Trinity was first coined by this guy, Tertullian. So, until you hear the word Trinity, the first person that coined the word Trinity was Tertullian. He thought that Trinity was only temporary though, and it had a beginning and it would have an ending. And he clearly said that the, the Son and the Spirit was subordinate to the Father. 
So one of the concepts that developed in the third century was the concept of subordinationism. What that mean is that the father was the only one that was superior. In other words, the father is eternal, but the son and the spirit was created by the father at some point in time, and they became gods too. So he said there are three that make up the Godhead, but the father is the supreme God, and the son and the spirit are subordinate to him. So that was the first concept of Trinitarianism. And this is where, so it started with one guy, Justin, saying, look here, the Logos, then it moved into, and, 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 and I'll show you bridging, this is how false doctrine come. It moved into the concept, no, no, you need to introduce the Holy Spirit, there's no mention of him. And they said, look here, let us now talk about the Holy Spirit. He had the same concept like Justin about subordinationism, but his subordinationism was a little different because now he introduced the Spirit and he's saying the Son and the Spirit is subordinate to the Father. And I said before, he introduced the term Trinity as an expedition that the three persons are one substance as discussed in God. In other words, the Father created the Son and the Spirit and they come from the same substance. And the sub one substance that they all come from was God. But however, only the, only the Father was eternal. The other two, which is God according to him, came from him and had a beginning. In Tertullian Trinity, the Father alone is eternal. And he's superior to the other two. My God. So, so the doctrine slowly start evolve. Now, while he, Tertullian, had this concept, later on, a guy by the name of Origen came up with an added version of the Trinity. He introduced a doctrine now of the eternal son. Because he's saying, okay, while the father is superior to the son, according to him, um, the son, if you go accept Justin's theology that the son is the Logos, then the son must also be eternal. Now, I want us to understand something, brethren. The sonship is not eternal. And we're going to talk about this. As I said, I'm telling you all the theology that came out from that time. And I will show you that the Bible itself teaches you clearly that the office of the son has a beginning. And the office of the son, according to 1 Corinthians, has an ending. There's going to come a point in time where, they, where he's going to give up the office of the son. There's no more need for the son. As a matter of fact, the sonship had a purpose. And the purpose was to redeem you, to become man so that he can die for you. But it had a beginning because there's going to come a point in time where there's no more need for the son. But we're going to talk about that. But Oregon said, his version of the Trinity said that there is a doctrine of eternal son. An eternal generation of the son. And he then therefore prepared a way to elevate the status of the second son, the second person. And although he himself still thought that the father was superior to the other two, he believed, however, that the son had a superior role than what Tertullian thought. My God. You saw the thing slowly, I, I, I go up the way. Then after him, you had like, People continue to debate the whole nature of God. Some were arguing that he was a distinct creature created by God. So you had the whole concept of some saying, boy, he was created by God. And others were saying he was fully divine and co-eternal with God. As a matter of fact, there was even a teaching that says that his, his Godness started at his baptism. In other words, he was not God until he reached a point. And that is one, that is one of the, the, what we call dynamic monarchism, which believes that at a point in time, amen, he was not God. But at his baptism, God gave him Godhoodness, if there is such a word. Amen. And therefore, so there was a whole debate that was taking place between after AD 150 right up to about AD 300 and something. In the 3rd century, Trinity and language became more common. And many theologians refer to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as one God in three persons. Note, the, the, the constant terminology was now being slowly being injected. And it reminds me of the whole thing about being desensitized. It's just like if we are not careful, then even in church, 
we have we have a principle that you know we and we have to be careful that we don't remove some things and allow some things to inject themselves in the body so when i was growing up amen when we greet a brother in respect of a woman that was a bless the lord amen nowadays people pass me hi i mean it feels a little weird and feels a little different but if you're not careful we will remove some of the, the, the stuff that makes us different people knew us you can have the pan and say bless the lord brother how you doing and, and we, 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 we're good to do that because we, we you know and we, and we have a way of talking as a boy you know we're not going to do this god's willing and so on and so forth but the concept amen uh it shows you by them just talking around in like this in those times the whole language of 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 of, of the trinity and the trinity and language by now the, the the doctrine or the term trinity was now introduced as well by tertullian and the whole um terminologies that that, that come along with that doctrine were now being infiltrated in the church i tell you most of this false teaching is like a cancer it it has a way of of coming into the body and and i've seen it it come into the body and it slowly if you're not careful if you don't spend the time to cut it out and let people and and, and remove some of these things amen that is why we're having problem with certain things because people want to remove some of the things and want to inject their own things and we see it even in the oneness theology over a period of 400 years people move from oneness to trinitarianism to this very day we still have that cancer to this very day we still have that debate and people people are more termed toward trinitarian terminologies than the oneness of god as opposed to in the first century people were more opposed to the oneness theology than anything else because that's what they knew when they read the scripture the god the father and the son or whatever they didn't really like how we read it they matter of fact a lot of times when we see the word and in the kjv and note the kjv was 60 to 11 by this time it was fully injected with trinitarianism theology so when the writer was writing he would use the word and but in many cases it can be translated even and we're going to talk about that as we look in the scripture for sure that it's just a language problem and therefore what had happened is that the, the, the whole terminologies of, of of trinity and talk was now hitting during that time though there was a guy that in the second century in the third century there was a concept that was called modalism amen and it was a concept in trinity that emerged what we said for in the second and the third century and there were some prominent guys that did this type of teaching sabalios and notius and praxis and these guys existed in the second and the third century but the, the most noted one of them is sabalios and a lot of people will tell you i've heard i've I remember one time I was talking to somebody about the oneness of God and he said, what do you believe? And I used the concept of he is the father in creation, the son in redemption, the Holy Ghost that working in the church. And he said, that's, that's, that, that's, that's Sabalianism. And I never understood what he meant. I was like, what do you mean? He said, that, that's a hearsay from the, first, from the second and third century. And I couldn't understand. And I, and I went and I spent my time to say, so people in the second and third century believed something that, that was similar to me. And why was it considered to be hearsay? So I did some research on it. And as I said earlier, there's a possibility that, that what Sabalius teaches is not what was truly communicated. That's the truth because people will skew your, what you have said. You can say something and they leave with what they think you have said. And they will say, this is what he used to teach. However... What they say he used to teach, amen, is not what we believe. So according to uh, the teachings of the modalist or, or the Sabalism teaching, it teaches that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are not distinct person, but instead represent different modes or aspects of the one God. Now we believe that. We believe that part. They say, albeit not simultaneously as all three. In other words, the problem with the teachings of modalists is that they believe that he, God, when he's God the Father, he only existed as God the Father up to the point where Jesus came on the scene. So when Jesus came on the scene, he took off that mask of God the Father and now put on the mask of God the Son. So while he was God, uh, while he was the Son of God, or better yet, God the Son, according to the model is teaching while he was now in that mode as the son the father role was not in existence 
And then while he removed from the role of the Son to the role of the Holy Spirit, the Son role is not. So it, at no point in time did, did all of these happen simultaneously. I hope you get that. No, we do not believe that. We believe that he was God, the Father, manifest in the flesh. And while he was in the flesh as the Son of God, he did not cease to be God. So while he was on the boat sleeping as a man, he was still God holding this universe in his hands. He was still God allowing the sun or the earth to go on its orbit around the sun. He was still in his rightful place. Praise God. So this was one of the doctrines that emerged from there. Now in AD 300 to 400, amen, um, there came another guy. And he, his name was Arius of Alexandria. And he came at the beginning of the 4th century. And Arius thought that Jesus Christ was not co-eternal or the same substance. And that word homoseos, amen, is a very popular word. Any, any, any theologian, for you mention this to them, they know what you're talking about. So they said he was not as the same substance as God the Father, but rather a created being with a beginning in time. So he pulled from something that existed back and he added to it no he he he, he held on to some trinitarian concept but the trinitarian concept was a little different because now he's saying that you have god the father but god but the son did not really come from the father they are not from the same substance he is a demigod and the spirit is a demigod so god the father is the only fully god Amen. So you see there's a little difference than what was taught before. They're not of the same substance. Amen. And therefore he was only created. And, it's, and to be noted, this is what the Jehovah's Witness believe. Without the spirit, they believe that Jesus was created. So God the Father created Jesus and through him he created all other things. As a matter of fact, in the book of Colossians, they have added the word other just in that concept so that they can back up this statement to say that God created Jesus and through Jesus he created all other things. Now, the theologians in those times had a problem with this because they, they, they started to now emerge into uh, the fact that they are of the same substance which came out of the teachings really of, of, of predecessors who said that even though the concept was different, they still believe that he came out of the same substance. Amen. So in 325 AD, Constantine called a council in Nicaea. And he brought together some of the bishops and the Roman and, 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 and all of these guys. And they, they, they spoke about Arianism. There was a, that was one of the big debates. That was what they wanted to contend. And at the council, they came up with a concept that we're going to reject the teaching of Arius. And we're going to affirm the doctrine of the Trinity. We hold that the Father, the Holy Spirit are equal, divine, and co-eternal. That's as far as they went to. As a matter of fact, the full development of the Trinity and doctrine was not yet developed here. It was only the concept that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are equal, divine, and co-eternal. Um, and therefore, under the influence of this guy, Athanaeus, Amen, and Athanaeus is one of these famous... Um, bishops in those times at the courts of Nicaea in 325 AD they rejected Arianism they considered it to be hearsay and what they did is that they started to work on a creed that they will all hold and it's very important to note though that some of the creeds that they held on to even some of them show that affirm some of the teachings some of the teachings that the apostles because they teach that in the Nicaean creed one of the teachings is that baptism was for the remission of sin. So even though they had changed the formula of baptism, and that came up as early as the second century, where the baptism and formula was changed, they affirmed that baptism was for the remission of sin. Amen. So when, um, just when um, was the, the beginning of the Reformation, Martin Luther, I think it was, who started the Reformation, when he said justification by faith, his concept of justification of faith is not the same as people who hold it today. He held on to, he merged it that baptism was also necessary for salvation. And I'm just showing that in to show you how doctrines has evolved over the time. So under the influence of Athanaeus, the cult of Nicaea in 325 rejected Arianism, which teaches that uh, 
God the Father was not of the same substance as the Holy Spirit and, 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 and Jesus. They said, look here, they have the same substance and they are the same. They started to work on that teaching. And in 381 AD, uh, based on the doctrine of Athanias and, and these Cappadocians, who are practically some bishops, some famous bishops that exist, they clarify the status of the Holy Spirit and place all three persons on equal footing. And why I said that is because in the Nicene Council, and the Nicene Creed of 325 AD, it never stated that the Holy Spirit was God. Amen. It was not until 325 where they added that they are co-eternal, co-existent, co and they, they came up with the, the full thing. The orthodox teaching of the Trinity was now fit, fully developed. And the doctrine is that God is co-substantial, co-eternal, and co-equal. Co they have the same substance. They all existed in eternity, and they are they're all equal. And, it's for the Father, and they came up with a framework like this. The Father is not the Son. And the Holy Spirit is not the Father, and the Holy Spirit is not the Son, but they are all God. And that, if you might see this, this diagram, copy places, but we don't believe that. And again, I show you all of these things, because all of these things that I'm telling you, I'm going to go back next week, and I'm going to use scripture now. So next week, we're going to be going to the Bible, we're going to do a lot of oneness, apostolic, deep, teaching in relation to this thing we're going we're going to dig it out we're going to show you the errors that exist in some of these things so we're kind of coming down let us look up back at the key development of the trinitarian doctrine and some key figures we spoke about tertullian he was the first guy that coined the trinity and he emphasized, he emphasized the distinction and the equality of the father son and holy spirit so he he was the first guy who coined it but his concept was a little different. We have Oregon who argued for the, ex the eternal existence of the Son. And by the way, we don't believe in the eternal Son. That's why we don't believe in God the Son. Amen. And he talked about the Holy Spirit and the equality with the Father. We have Athanias who defended the deity of Christ and the doctrine of the Trinity against the Arian heresy. And the Arian heresy says that, look here, they are not of the same substance, even though you have God the Father. They have, and they're, 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 they're not equal to him and they're not of the same substance then you have people like um, Sibalius who was a teacher from Libya and he teaches that the Father, Son and Holy Spirit are not, dis are not distinct persons in other words they are not you know have three distinct people but they are one but his concept is that they are different modes and they don't exist at the same time and they have Arius who denied the deity of Christ and thought that he was a created being now, why do I go through all of this? I want us to understand that the development of the Trinity and Doctrine was a gradual process that occurred over several centuries and involved drifting from what the apostles preached until a new accepted doctrine became fully developed and accepted. What do we learn from this? We have to be careful, brethren, when we begin to drift from what was originally taught and learned. I know that we are in a new time and people say we are in new age. So they want to do things a little different. But guess what happened? The word of God. What was taught by the apostles. What was taught in scriptures is for all ages. It spans all ages. Amen. Until Jesus come, it will be applicable. And there is nothing that we need to modify and change. The belief in a single God remains the central to both Christianity and Judaism, despite the fact that the doctrine of the Trinity came about. The doctrine of the Trinity was not taught by the apostles. The doctrine of the Trinity didn't come about till 400 years after the fact. The baptism and formula of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost did not, was not introduced until way after the fact. The apostles baptized in Jesus' name. The apostles believed in the filling of the Holy Ghost. The apostles believed in repentance. The apostles believed that there was one God. The doctrine of the Trinity continues to be a topic of discussion and debate within even Christianity today. Even today, they have people who still hold on to this. You have the, the famous theologians like James White and these men who would try to tell you, even of apostolics who have, diver who have diverted from truth and gone into this, 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 this doctrine of devil. Let me tell you something. The whole doctrine of the Trinity came way back. It, it came out of the whole Babylonian system. Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. It's the, the devil, just, 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 it, what he's doing is just, is just recycling what he has done. 
You mean it? talk about Temiramis and Sam and, 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 and Tammuz and the whole teachings of the, the, the Son and the Father worship. All of these things. The doctrine, the, the, this is devilish. Because it, the Bible says, if you believe that there is one God, you do well. Because even the devil is injecting this. Even the devils, they believe and they tremble. The root problem of Trinity and error, both historically and theologically, is a failure to heed and comprehend Colossians 2, verse 8 to 10. The fact that you accept this, we start where, or we end where we started, is the fact that you, have, you don't want to understand. It's a failure in understanding what the Apostle Paul said to the church at Colossians. He gave a warning, and I'm giving the same warning to everybody who is online. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and feign deceit. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not of the Christ. Why? For in him, this is Jesus, dwells, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. We can look at what that means next week. The, the Trinity, and in order to defend their concept, they look at the Godhead like a system, like a government. That's why the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, but the Father is not Jesus. And, you know, because of how they look at it. But we're going to look at what the scripture means and what they understood it to mean. Even if we, if we go into the Greek to get what it means, we're going to do it. Because my aim is to help us to earnestly contend for the faith. And guess what? When we understand that we are complete in him, which is the head of all principalities and powers. And you know the funny thing about the Bible says, let every power be subjected to the higher power. For there is no power but that of God. But it gets it. Jesus is the head of all principalities and power. Jesus must be God. Jesus must be God. Brethren, I pray God that you know, we have learned something tonight. You know, we went through history. We looked at the development of the Trinitarian doctrine. We look at how it has evolved, at how it has drifted from truth, even from the first century, even from what Jews believe in strict monotheism, even what the apostles believe in the first century. We saw where, you know, the whole issue came with Justin about the Logos. We see where Tertullian attacked that and, and coined the word doctrine, not understanding what to do practically with the Holy Spirit, but still was rejecting Binitarianism, which is the belief in two gods. I mean, and he coined Trinitarian. We look at Origen, who came up with the term the eternal son. I mean, had a concept. We look at all of these things that have developed over the time to where it is today. Amen. But guess what? At the end of the day, our aim is to go back to what the word of God says. Study this to show yourself approved unto God. Amen. For without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Amen. He is the only true God. That's why the Bible could have said in Revelation that he is the Alpha and he is the Omega. That he is the beginning and that he is the ending. I pray God that we have learned something tonight. Tonight we're going to take it part two. And this time we're going to go next week, that is, we're going to take it to part two of this. But we're going to now look more into scriptures. I'm going to start even where they start. And God said, let us make man. Let us start there and try to see what the Bible has to say. Let us look at it from a Jewish perspective. Let us look at it from a scriptural perspective. And let us try to understand that Jesus is God. And there is none like him. God bless you tonight as I bow my head in prayer. I will bow our heads as we pray. As we close this Bible study tonight. Great God, we thank you tonight for your word. We thank you, God, that we have the record it is written that you are God. We thank you that we have the revelation that you are not no second person in no trinity. 
but you are God Almighty. We thank you, Jesus, that he that cometh to God must believe that you are, that you are God. Amen. We thank you, God, that in your name, your very name, speaks to who you are. You are God who has become our salvation. You are Jehovah that has become our salvation. God, I pray right now, God, for every hearer tonight who has listened to this Bible study. I pray, God, that they will even take it a bit further and they will study more so that they be able to give an answer to people who ask them questions of their faith. I pray, God, that you'll help us that we will earnestly contend for this faith. Amen. As we look into the, the key tenets of the gospel, as we look into the key tenets of the apostolic church, the church that started on the day of Pentecost, that you are one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And we must love the Lord with all our hearts, with all our soul, and with all our might. Thank you, we know, God, that you are the great God of heaven. Hallelujah. That angels bow before you. Hakabaya. And that heaven and earth adore you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Amen. That you would not leave us comfortless. And that we knew that it was Jesus who came to us. For you said it, you will, you will come. We thank you, God, that you came in your Father's name. Amen. We thank you, Jesus, that we understand. Amen. That you are God. You are God. Holy and righteous is your name. God, bless this, every hero tonight. Bless every person on this session. Bless every new convert. Bless every sinner. Bless every unsaved. Oh God, bless them that they will be in the world tonight. In the mighty and the most exalted name of Jesus, I pray. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. We thank you, Holy Ghost, in Jesus' name. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. God bless you. Amen. This week, by way of announcement, we have singles conference coming up. Amen. I want our single people, praise God, to be prayed up and be ready. Praise God for the conference. Because I know God has something in store for you. Amen. And Sunday we have service. Sunday school starts at 9. Amen. And I ask that if you have not been in Sunday school for a while, try to make an effort to come out to Sunday school. There is, there is a blessing in coming and learning the word of God. Amen. And I pray God that we will continue to, you know, stay in the word and to grow in the word, to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. God richly bless you in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. God bless you.